What up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Jesse Warden here. Today, we are going to cover serverless challenges and learnings, basically from the past three years. Jesse Warden. So I've been doing serverless off and on for five years professionally. A teensy bit of things I did seven years ago, I didn't really know were serverless, I guess. But we're going to cover some of that. And majority of it is from the perspective of a UI developer who's done a little bit of back end for Amazon Web Services for AWS. However, some of the things that I've done are briefly with Azure, briefly with Google, and they're applicable to any type of cloud services. So if you're getting the serverless, you're not sure what it is, I have a lot of advice for you, some good and bad. And hopefully you can find some value from that, but also some insight on some things as I'm still learning. What I found interesting was my boss said, hey, look, why don't you take what you've learned from serverless from the past three years, the challenges you had and how you overcame them. And I started thinking about all the things that I've learned in the past three years, which is very different from two. It kind of accelerated because I had to learn backend. I had to learn sometimes things not to do with APIs like DevOps. And, you know, got my hands dirty a little bit in the server world too, just to have an appreciation of what serverless could really offer, not just empowering me to be a backend person with no Unix knowledge, right? And so I've just learned so much in three years. So I wanted to take today to cover these 17 topics or areas, go over to them, and then give some detail about some of the challenges I had in each one of those sections, what I learned, some suggestions, and some things uh, I'm still learning about, right? Just basically show the vulnerability of things I don't know. So I thought it would help out a lot just because in 2021, I think serverless has really reached a crescendo. There's a lot of other cloud providers offering options and it's a lot to take in and it's really fun. <laughs> so if you want to get in and have fun, it can be overwhelming, but it, it, you can still just do a teensy piece and still have fun. You don't have to know it all. I just wanted to cover the gamut of all that just to give some insight. So the 17 things I wanted to cover, the challenges and lessons since basically 2017. So it's towards the end of 2017, it's about three years of just things that I've learned in my current position at Capital One and listening to the Twitter sphere. So although I do work professionally, a lot of these things have to do with me participating in social media, writing blog posts, watching YouTube videos, seeing, you know, both going to conferences and seeing conference, uh, like giving my own sessions and then watching other sessions. It's just amazing how diverse and interesting it is, despite the fact that we've kind of plateaued, right? It's interesting. There's cloud providers, there's Oracle and Amazon and Google and Microsoft with Azure. And then you have a lot of these startups that kind of build solutions on top and then have niche, niches form or their niches like something to make that easier to build or maybe tools for that. So very, very interesting time to get involved. Very, very fun time too. There's still a lot of innovation left. So these 17 things are basically areas that I had a lot of what I felt challenges, things I felt like I've learned and overcome, and some things I'm still trying to figure out. So let's, let's give you a high level overview of what these things are, and then we'll dive deep. So nomenclature is basically all the words. Dealing with the server lovers and the serverless lovers, or what they talk about, the different things that they, they place meanings on for words, and then taking those two types of individuals and then putting them in different cloud contexts. So you're a server lover over in Azure versus I'm a serverless lover in Amazon. Like, are we saying the same thing? You know, do we really know what serverless really means? For example, if you have the .NET runtime and it, it challenge, you know, takes a lot of the problems away from you that I would have to do for raw, is that really the same thing? And then some of the services, if you don't use Elk and you have your own built-in logging solution, how does that work? And then when I say the word serverless function, does it mean the same thing to you and Azure, for example? So very, very interesting trying to understand what serverless and Lambda means to each individual. Identifying what shouldn't be serverless. That is a wonderful thought exercise where you're trying to figure out, I'm, I'm a prima donna, right? I love my new toys. I have a short attention span, but I still love doing front end stuff and augmenting it a little bit with back end stuff. I've, I've found there's some new toys back there, but I love new toys and I love try new frameworks and whatever, because I just get bored and I want to learn something new. And I also want to feel like the things that I'm learning are still building, you know, core skills, right? It's cool to go on a different skill tree, but you, you want the main character that you are to level up, right? And so that exercise of saying, all right, I have a hammer, everything's a nail. What shouldn't I strike with this hammer, right? And that's identifying what should be serverless. Very interesting thought exercise. Uh, hybrid, hybrid architectures are where 
some things for a variety of reasons. A, it should be a server, right? There should be a server for that. It's probably the appropriate architecture. Or B, we don't have time to figure out how to make it serverless. Um, some of those things can actually work out quite well, whether skill level, all kinds of reasons. So it's okay not to be pure serverless or pure servers. You can actually do hybrids and they work well. I, I found that out through real-world experience. It's pretty cool. Time limits. This seems to be a thing that keeps coming up. We've stopped talking about cold starts. That's the last time I'm going to mention that in this entire video, right? So we've stopped talking about it. It's not a problem. We moved on. But time limits still keep coming up and they are a problem. And there's certain ways to go about it that some people view as astronomically difficult. Others like it's not a big deal. Like it's built in, right? And that, that thought change is very, very interesting. And I'm not sure why you know, that keeps coming up, but it's just interesting how you look at that as a problem or an opportunity, right? Testability is about building the serverless servers as testable units. So we think about our code on a server, we make that code testable, but the infrastructure, not so much. But now that your code is the infrastructure, not just like the deployment me mechanism, but the, the artifact that you're deploying, you make that a little more testable in different ways to verify that your system works. So it's a very interesting slight change, right? You're still doing like ping for APIs and health checks, but the way in which you expose functionality to test it just to see if it works when it's deployed, that kind of stuff. Infrastructure testing, basically, if you think like that. Development would be, how do you code this stuff? How do you go about your day, test a line of code? I wrote, hello world, I wanna see it work in serverless. How do I do that? How do I, now that I've seen that, now I've got a deployment pipeline, how do I continue to do that? What is my CI CD process in terms of me writing code? What does that look like? And testing would be the traditional testing of code, not infrastructure. Like you wanna do unit tests and integration tests and acceptance tests and property tests. And what does that look like? How, how do this performance test actually operate on stuff, right? Remote testing would be, I have, all that running locally, how does that differ from what's deployed in the infra? Is it different? What are the nuances there? Re uh, deployment would be the massive topic around what tools you use like Terraform and Ansible versus do you use the CDK or do you use AWS SAM? Do you embrace serverless applications or are you just like, dude, just deploy a Lambda list? Like what? That, that area is gigantic and the operations people are very passionate about what they do. Some don't care at all. And some are like, why would you use that stuff? It's very fascinating, uh, big area to learn. And so lack of API gateway, this is the tip of the iceberg. So if you don't know, API gateway is the way for Amazon to give you a URL and you can link it to anything, a Lambda, a server, a service they have that's managed, an event bus, whatever. And it's a very powerful way to test things because you want inputs and outputs to test your code, right? Well, now you have a URL. You can paste in a browser and see if your stuff works. See if your event bus works. See if your application works. Run your functional. I mean, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And I can't use it. And so that's kind of where AWS is going with a lot of their services. They continue to enhance that functionality. And I don't have that. People in the community talk about it's the status quo, de facto standard. That's how you do things. You expose API gateway. You don't really need to talk about what it is or how you do it because everyone uses it, right? No. <laughs> And so that's, it's not just API Gateway. There is a litany of wonderful new services from Azure and Google and AWS, and not all of them are allowed to be used by certain individuals and certain companies in certain contexts. It's not that they don't want to use them. It's just they're not allowed to for federal reasons, cyber reasons, and et cetera. So thinking about how there's an obvious architecture solution or, or few, right, because best practices are still being figured out, but how can you think about compensating for that lack of ability or what were you doing before they made it easier for you to do your job, right? So to give you an example, there is AWS Synthetics and it allows you to write API and UI testing. What I think is cool about it is they found a way to get Puppeteer as a Lambda layer. So now you can have a Selenium grid that's serverless. You don't have to build it yourself. And that's amazing for performance testing, for automating your UI and a pipeline and it's serverless automated test. Like, that's so unbelievably awesome. That's not what synthetics is. That's just one piece of the functionality. But that kind of stuff, if you didn't have that, what would you do? Right? How would you set that up? So that that's what I would lack of API gateway is kind of a gateway to thinking about those kind of ways of developing. And then resource limits. This is again goes with the time limits, but I, I bring it up because there's certain IO bound and CPU bound problems.
that come up and you really have to think about how do you approach this from an architecture and code perspective. It affects the language you choose and frameworks and things like that. And then debugging, you can debug not just the breakpoints, but I mean like your code doesn't work, your app doesn't work. How do you figure it out, right? How do you, how do you identify what the problem is? Security groups, not a lot to say about that other than that it's a lot of ways that your application breaks. A lot of us programmers from the olden days have been trained that if something doesn't work, it's not the runtime, it's not a library, it's not your OS, it's not DNS, it's your code, and you need to figure it out and just breathe. I know you're frustrated. That's not true anymore. <laughs> a lot of times it is the library, it is the SDK, uh, or it's something you just ran out of IP addresses, right? But in my experience in AWS, 90% of the time, it is security groups that immediately breaks your stuff. And it's reasonably easy to detect by you have nothing to detect. It just never comes back. So security groups will talk about that. It's not a lot to say. IAM roles, same thing. But there are interesting ways to expose testability to allow your application to work. So as IAM roles get more and more strangled and have very few abilities that you can use now to make them safe from a cyber perspective, it becomes very difficult to test your application from a test-driven development right green refactor and just have that there and then know that what broke in the future was not your code, was not infrastructure, but was an IAM role. It's very, very important from a testing perspective. And then identifying latency isn't really just for APIs. It's more about if you're embracing serverless, you're using functions for everything. And sometimes there's one of many. So how do you, in distributed architectures, identify that latency? And I'm, I'm still learning this, but... There's some basic tools for it and basic techniques you can use in libraries and things like that. The last two are pretty big. So concurrency is about how do cloud providers solve concurrency problems and parallelism problems in a, what used to be a language problem. So you look at like languages like Erlang or Elixir or the Aka framework for like Java and Scala, for example, those were built to allow easy, hugely scale concurrency. And then AWS is like, we well, just give us money and we'll handle it. That completely changes my views of how I would use something like Go or Rust or Elixir or Lang for the Beam engine, right? To get those concurrency. If AWS just does, it makes it easier, right? So very, very interesting thing about how serverless kind of changed my viewpoints on concurrency. And then lastly, compromising, which is about me. Anytime you see somebody massively dogmatic and passionate about a subject that they won't bend on their assertive, it's a lot of times not about that. They're probably projecting about something and, and you, unfortunately you may need to dig to find out where this insecurity or projection is coming from and i found a lot of my serverless you know i have a hammer everything's a nail is because i do not enjoy working with servers especially at my place of work where they require a lot of maintenance and security you have to be very careful about how you make you keep those things up to date you make sure that you you know, cyber is first, right? We, we take cyber very seriously. And so it's a lot of work, a lot of maintenance. And the whole point of serverless is that you don't have to do that anymore. The whole point of disposable infrastructure is that you don't care about it anymore. And yet it's still a lot of work. And so I'm passionate about that. And I've realized over the past three years, part of my evangelism around serverless has been through projection. So I still haven't figured it out from a, I, I think it's very similar to code perspective. You look at a lot of functional programmers who are, dogmatic in, about functional programming and like are very down on OOP and they say, well, you know, I used to code OOP and now I'm an FP. So da, 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 da. It's not about a lot of times that FP is better. It's because they and myself included don't ever want to work there. We don't enjoy that code base. So it has a lot of times nothing to do with the scientific validity of one being better than the other, but rather please, for the love of God, do not make me code in an OOP language or in case of serverless, please, for the love of God, don't make me work on servers, <laughs> right? So compromising, interesting topic. All right, so let's get into the details of these things. So from a nomenclature perspective, the challenge, here's a basic one. Lambda means something different to different people. When you say the word Lambda function or just Lambda, it's crazy how something so basic and obvious and you can link to the docs, myself included, means something very different. Language is not just like the language you use, such as English or Spanish or whatever, and you think differently by using that particular language. Even Lambda itself is just loaded with all kinds of different meanings. And so it's interesting when you talk to other people 
that the nomenclature right out the get go is completely messed up. And so that's why you don't have effective communication with serverless because we're still figuring out what that means or we have figured it out in our own view and it's different. So that's been very crazy. So for example, a mathematician will say lambda calculus, which means that you have a single input and a single output. If you've looked at any of the docs for Lambda, that's not how it works at all, especially in Python. Event is the first parameter, context is the second, <laughs> right? If you're in Go or Lua, you can return multiple parameters, right? So like already we have a problem <laughs> with like Lambda calculus isn't mathematically correct. So let's go with that math thing. A functional programmer, oh, and before I go there, which kind of leads into functional, math, math, mathematicians in Lambda Calculus don't allow free variables, AKA side effects. So you can't do console log. You can't read and write files. So that concept of stateless architecture, like, hmm, yes, yeah, so you, you know, it's basically just state, stateless code and takes inputs. Like, no, you can do side effects, <laughs> right? So it's not really quite true to call it a Lambda function, right? So functional programmer, we believe that it's a single argument function and that it's a single input, single output, but that's not really what Lambda is. It is to us, but then you have to think about, okay, where, assuming you had types, what parts of these functions or function are doing IO, let's mark it as such, identify those side effects and make it as impotent as possible. So a functional programmer views lambdas as inputs and outputs, and they may or may not have side effects. And if there's a distributed architecture, they want to know, you know, which ones have it. Some are dogmatic and they want to know which done has IO and which doesn't. The rest of us are like, just push it to the sides. Right, it's a very common thing in TDD as well. The U people do the same thing; they push the, you know, the side effects to the sides. So it's just different viewpoint, right? The, a lot of the open imperative people could view this as like, it's just where my code goes. Who cares if it's a function? Like, it's actually a, a method on my class, you weirdo. Uh, serverless noobs think of it as my code runs once. So unlike a server, it runs once. So Express starts up and Express shuts down. Like that's was my viewpoint. I think four years ago until I learned what serverless was, but there are thousands of people to this day who continue to use adapters for Spring Boot in Java or ExpressJS in JavaScript to enable a stateful style server in Lambda that only lasts for like three seconds. And that's how they accomplish things. And like, we're supposed to accept this, right? Unconditional love is about not wanting people to change. But we're programmers. We want other people to learn what we know. So it's, it's so weird that you just like, well, just because... I did it three years ago. Does not make it okay for you to do it, Jesse? Really? Really? Uh, serverless fans, it's weak, hard to monitor, hard to debug, won't scale. We're concerned about cyber. We want to know, you know, an audit trail. There's just a lot of prejudice and some maybe rightly so about lambdas and serverless in general about managed services. A lot of people who know how to manage Elk don't like Amazon's managing elk. I think it's great because I don't like managing elk. I just want to be able to search my logs, right? <laughs> but to other people, like, no, no, you can't do the Unix thing at the blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. So to them, they extend that frustration to like serverless because there's certain magic. Like, do can we hit the database and then pay for more reads? How does that work? So interesting thing like that, Java developers. Uh, I always make fun of job developers. It's got to happen every time I talk to somebody. So Spring Boot takes 30 seconds to respond to one request, right? And it's not always true. <laughs> the JVM is notorious for once it's started up, it can just scale horizontally extremely well. That's why people continue to use Java, continue to use Scala, continue to use uh, Clojure on top of it, Akka, all these other frameworks because of the JVM's proven ability. There are jobs for JVM tuning. It's an amazing thing. But when you look at Lambda, a lot of it's for the small dynamic languages like Ruby and Python and JavaScript to quickly start up, right? So you can do it with fast with Java. It's fine. It's just that the warming takes a little bit longer with some of the Java stuff, depending on all your libraries. And that's okay. But they just look at that and they get frustrated. And they're like, I would rather have my Java JVM in a Docker container, which slows it down even more, on an EC2, which slows it down even more. Because once it boots up, it's faster than everything. And that's that server mentality. And if that's where they come from, that's fine. The Java developers who are more in serverless and they like the code, they don't have that. So interesting, even in a community, you can have that, that disconnect. Very, very interesting. And there's bleeding between that too. Architects, especially the cynical ones, they really don't like noobs taking monoliths and turning them into distributed systems. So you can take like a Lambda list, you're like, all right, I've graduated. I have a good CD process. 
I want to make all these lambdas, little itty bitty lambdas, and are orchestrated by one big step function. It's like, dude, can you just keep your type language and make it one lambda? It's really easy to deploy, really easy to like test and roll back. And we have the code in a single repo and everyone knows what to do. No, let's put it all over the place. <laughs> and so like architects just are really leery of that stuff. Some architects are like, whatever. If you're willing to, you know, handle your mess, that's fine. So that kind of nomenclature around Lambda for them immediately speaks to distributed architecture, right? Lambda lists. A Lambda list is when you take a monolith application and you put it into a Lambda. The Lambda list implies that that's not the normal thing for Lambda list. And that's Lambdas. And that's why you call it a Lambda list, right? Because it's a weird term. It's not the norm. Lambda lists are the norm for some people. There are tons of people putting APIs in ETLs, like extract transform load, data science, all kinds of things, a single code base into a Lambda. It is the norm. It's not what I would do, maybe, depending on the application the team, right? But it's just a very common thing. Um, and this last one's huge. I, I, I'm not sure this is ever going to go away. Lambda is not a microservice. Function as a service is not a microservice. And yet it, you see it in blogs, you see it in API, you see it in conference talks, you see it in documentation sometimes where they just imply, oh yeah, you're, you're microservice, like you're Lambda. It's like, well, no, sometimes they really are just functions. Well, but it's deployed like as a service, right? It has inputs out. No, it has no triggers. Like somebody else has to manually trigger it. Oh, okay. So they like call invoke. So it's kind of like GPRC, but like with, it's like, no, it's like one line of code, <laughs> right? Or two, whatever. So it's, it, lambdas can really be functions. And if, if you think of like, I'm not a big DDD fan, but if you think of domain driven design, where you have a bounded context, we have a bunch of stuff that are kind of related. Sometimes that's what lambdas are. They're functions that are on that bounded context. They're not a microservice. You don't want to independently deploy them. You want to deploy them all at once sometimes, right? So they're not congruent all the time. Just keep in mind. And then functional programmers. So some of the solutions I found if you're a functional programmer, work really well with Lambda. One of the solutions is encourage converting result or either type errors to true exceptions. What that means is, is that if you keep most of your code functional, you're not going to have runtime exceptions. You're going to have errors that come back from functions that could possibly fail, right? What that means, though, is that's not how AWS works. AWS gives you inputs and takes outputs, or they expect an exception. That's how it works. The the Docker container explodes, okay, they start a new one on ECS or Kubernetes, right? Your Lambda explodes, they retry to process the SQS message. Like that contract of dynamic languages and Java, right? Even with null pointers, they look for those exceptions. That's how the contract is, is you either give me a value back or you explode. That's what they expect, right? So if you're a functional developer, that's like, we don't do that. Well, you do, but think of it like Rust or dry returns in Python, where you call unwrap. The last thing you do is you say, give me the value or explode, right? Unwrap. So think of it like that. Um, try to keep all that stuff in the handler. So if you do just the explosions in the handler, then you're fulfilling the contract with Lambda, right? With the serverless stuff. Continue to be aware of IO and make it impotent. So John D goes, the guy who made Zio for Scala, he's got a really good take on Twitter. I'm not sure if I can find it, but I'll, I'll try to put it in a video if I can find it. He talks about a lot of the frustrations with marking your functions as IO. So like specifically like the IO monad where you have to handle the fact that this function is impure, but it's going to do a side effect. So it's going to be contained in this area and it's not going to affect the computation, but you have to know about it. Maybe it's idempotent. Who knows? Like that's up to you to handle. So you, as long as you know what's I.O., like you keep it in your head, you're good. If it's a gigantic monolith, I know it's hard, but just be aware of I.O. and try to make it as idempotent as possible because then all your serverless functions are easy to test that way. And, and you can have a lot more confidence that when they explode, you know, for a fact that the side effects that you wrote in there did or did not happen, right? Using step functions, um, you can have one I.O. per Lambda helps a lot. So obviously you might have three I.O.s per Lambda, but if you think about all your functions that may have some kind of side effect and they might have a lot of information around that. So like making an HP call, getting that data back, parsing that data, that for a functional programmer, that's a lot of things that can go wrong that you might pattern match into a result or an either, right, L right or left. So those two things could actually be the IO only for that particular Lambda and then you deploy another one, right? You don't have to put them in a monolith. 
So that's kind of as a functional developer, how I've kind of viewed it. And then step functions, you treat those as functions as well. So they may have a lot of IO in them, but they have an input and they have an output. And the cool thing about step functions is that 99.9% of the time, they don't throw exceptions and you treat it as, oh, okay, we got a response back. Um, APIs, they can work as monoliths. So I found this is very interesting. A lot of the APIs, if you have like pattern match and the event type or just the route, that seems to work really well. If you have a language like Rescript or OCaml or Haskell or F Sharp, where you treat your pattern matching against those routes, monoliths for that actually feels really normal. It, it, if you look at almost like all the patterns for, they'll say like one API route per Lambda and they'll like have an API gateway or an, or an uh, application load balancer pointing to like a single Lambda. And they're like, well, no, no, there's no crosstalk between these microservices. We got nice little, you know, self-contained services that do not share code, right? Or they do, they, it's sort of Lambda layer. I, I found that sometimes it's just easier to make a monolith from these really small APIs. So um, as someone who really likes distributed architectures and the challenges they bring, sometimes, man, I just, I think if you have pattern matching, it can work really well there. All right, so last thing about nomenclature. Serverless itself is so large now, it offers something you know, different to different people, which means the word serverless means something completely different to someone else because what's important to serverless for them has true meaning. So an example is a server fan likes Fargate. That's what serverless means to them. That is not anywhere remotely close what it means to me. To them, they're like, you know, the biggest challenge we have ECS is that we have to update the AMI or the OS the server uses every couple weeks, right? and it breaks our logging, or something on the driver doesn't work with Docker, or we have to update our container at the same time, and then we have to test, and then the deployment didn't go well, and because it's, the EC2s are so large, it takes like five minutes to spin up, and we have to do an east and west, and like Fargate would solve all these problems, and I'm like, stop using ECS, <laughs> like stop, stop using servers, and they're just like, no, 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 Fargate's the, jet, you know, the bomb, so interesting, that's not what serverless means to me, but it does to them. Startup Junkie, Heroku, that to them is serverless. That was kind of like my first real experience with serverless, not counting like uploading PHP to server, right? To an FTP server. I didn't have to configure PHP. I just uploaded code and it worked. And like, I didn't manage the server. It just did its thing, right? This is the same thing. Like Heroku was where you could upload an API, but you didn't have to use PM2 or forever with Node. You didn't have to do Redis to have your Node can like to talk to each other. Like you didn't have to use the cluster module. Like you just had an API, you upload it to Roku with a config and say, use two clusters or whatever they call their, you know, their scaling. And like, that was it. It's like the simplest serverless thing ever. And so a lot of startup people make fun of AWS people because like, dude, your serverless is complicated, <laughs> right? And they're right. Like Heroku is awesome. Uh, Elk fans, they look at it as like managed service. So this is something I completely forget about, but it's hugely powerful. You don't have to set up Kafka. Amazon provides it for you. You just use it. You don't have to set up Elk. They manage it. You don't have to set up Redis. They manage it. Like all these services they manage and you can utilize. Event buses through SQS. They manage it. You want to text people and email them with messaging. Okay. SNS. Like these services are managed by them and you just use APIs. They handle all the stuff. So it never goes down. You don't have to provision it. You just send them money. Like that's amazing. <laughs> like, it's really, really simple. And that has nothing to do with Lambda. So I just, the Elk fan is a big kind of like duh, but I had to re-examine is that to them, managed services are a big deal for serverless, right? They, they don't have to manage Kafka servers and horizontally scale based on how many, you know, throughputs you're using for that particular IP address range and servers and blah, blah, blah. So managed service, big deal. Developer, to me, it means no infrastructure to care for. So the only problems are code problems and I can fix those, which makes me a rock star. So that's what serverless means to me. So you, I mean, very, very, very different meanings for serverless for different people, right? So that's kind of what I was getting at. All right, so let's talk about what should not be serverless. <laughs> Can everything be serverless? Maybe, right? But here's clearly what shouldn't be. Number one, when a team knows and is skilled at building and maintaining servers, they are Unix, ops, operations, DevOps, whatever, rock star. They are the people who throughout my career have always put my code on a server somewhere. So I've been a front-end developer for around 12 years. I only did back-end stuff a little bit for eight years. So they are the ones who enabled my career, right? So they're the kind of the people in engineering, like in Star Trek, that make the ship work. And I just fly it, but I take 
you know, I have no idea how any of it works. So that's that team is not going to enjoy messing with lambdas. Like they like to build tooling on top of Docker and Kubernetes to enable you to have serverless, right? That's their shtick. They're not going to enjoy messing around with SQS and things like that. They want to be the ones to set up, you know, the the message bus or the RabbitMQ or the Kafka or things like that. So, yeah, that team not going to work for serverless. If that's what they want to do, you want to enable them to have fun in their career and aim them at skill sets that they enjoy, right? Now, there are opportunities in serverless to scale, all, all kinds of interesting challenges. And so they can probably be the best equipped there because they know what the heck's going on. They probably have an insight of how it's managed as serverless, even though there's a server somewhere, right? They kind of are, are really equipped for that. But generally, that's been my experience is that if you like serverless, you're going to work with a team that is already bought in. You're not going to be the consultant to go sell the team right? on that. Easy to show cost savings using a server. So there's an article I send around all the time called From Serverless to Elixir. And the guy evaluated a bunch of different services because their lambdas for log parsing started getting really expensive. And they were scaling just fine. They were working just fine. They just continued to spend money and as more and more teams were onboarded and they were responsible for auditing these logs. And so they would have more and more logs as more and more teams got more and more applications. And so they're spending like, you know, $30,000 a month or whatever, which I know isn't a big deal for some companies, but they knew based on the team experience of doing other servers that there was, they could save a lot of money if they could get a language to work on an EC2 at that particular scale and then horizontally scale, you know, more servers, right? Based on users. And so they just had to figure out like what language and framework that they want to use for that. So I send that article not as an anti-serverless, but more as a message to recognize that if you're going to spend a year to figure things out, you better hope that you don't have the innovator's dilemma of like, how do I spend time on feature development while not taking my team's entire time of maintaining this thing? They didn't maintain this thing they threw money at it and it worked. It never went down because it's serverless. All they had to do was pay more money to scale it horizontally. Nothing in my career has ever worked like that. <laughs> like the innovator's dilemma is always like, well, we spend more time managing technical debt in the old thing, the building the new thing, or we build all the new thing, but it's a rewrite. So it doesn't have all the features of the old thing because no one can really define what the old thing was. And so, you know, that's, that's a huge selling point for serverless, man, is if you read that article. So again, it's all about Elixir and Beam and how amazing it is horizontally scale and you can build Fortnite, blah, blah, blah. But that's that's the cost savings, right? Sometimes servers can save you buku amounts of money. Um, so can serverless. No trigger. So you can't build reactive architectures if you don't have events. If you don't have events, how can you trigger your Lambda? So you give me an example Kafka, Kubernetes, Kinesis, like they have ways of triggering infrastructure and data. So you can run lambdas, you can run SQS, you can have API gateway automatically from a REST call call this thing and trigger this thing, right? So it's all a reactive architectures and event driven, input outputs. This event triggers this result and it's idempotent or not. And there's FIFO queues and all that other stuff. What it, that assumes there's an event to start the whole thing, right? Well, what if that didn't exist? Well, that's where you have a server, right? So WebSockets. Um, Kafka, if you don't, if you have your own Kafka thing, you're not using managed Kafka, somebody there has to look for a particular message and trigger something that you can latch onto, like an event bus or <laughs> event bridge or SQS or an API call or something. If there's no event, then you can't do serverless because then you have some dude polling and you do this stupid hybrid approach where you then forward the messages to like Kinesis or SQS or something, right? So I've seen that happen twice where there's just no trigger. So it's just easier to set up an ECS cluster. When the algorithm is hard to pause or resume. So we'll get into this a bit in timing. Basically, a lot of algorithms are based on running on stateful servers. They assume time is forever. And they'll, in, in scalability, right? If you have a, a one gig file, it takes you five minutes. If you have a 50 gig file, it takes you 50 minutes. And they're like, it's fine. It just takes longer, right? But Lambdas don't have that time. It's not even supposed to, I mean, you can do 50 minutes at the time of this video, but that's not the point. Like the point is supposed to be seconds, right? So, and you can paralyze that and pause and resume. And that only works with functional thinking, like generator functions in JavaScript or, you know, pausable functions in like Python, for example, where you can, languages where you can block and like pause functions, that stuff, or even coroutines in Lua. That kind of stuff assumes that algorithms support that. And a lot of them don't. Like try to, try to make half a zip file in Node.js right now. 
like you can't use the stream API because those things like pause, like they take data and they give it, you can kind of stop at five megs, but a lot of those libraries, like, what are you doing? Like I already have this file system ready to go. I'm adding bytes. I'm adding to a buffer. What do you mean? Pause. Like you want to see half a zip? Well, yeah. Like if you're trying to parse 50 gigs and concurrently scale that over, you know, defined mainframe files that have very specific one megabyte, you know, slicing points, then launch 50 lambdas. Well, wait, how do I do one fiftieth of a parsing job? Like in theory, it seems really easy, but a lot of the libraries, a lot of the thought, a lot of the articles aren't really set up for that. So a lot of those places can be done, but sometimes it's just easier to say heck with it and do that part in the server. All right, so hybrid architecture. So you, you identify maybe something should be in a server, but other things are in serverless. So we want to re reduce the blast radius and make the easy things there, but all the hard parts or maybe the beefy parts or maybe the cost parts and servers. How does that work? So given distributed architectures are made in pieces, there's opportunity to use both serverless and serverless together. And what I mean by that is like, you can have some parts of like your event bus and your APIs in serverless, but maybe your WebSocket is in servers, right? So for example, sometimes we don't know how to do something in serverless. And so instead of like, my, you know, full blast, go everything to serverless, we, we know how like to do this one part in servers. So let's do that. Sometimes it's knowledge based. An example would be like moving files. We need to move them, encrypt and decrypt them using Lambda, but parsing these files takes a lot of CPU, takes a lot of time, and we wanna target the Lambdas to high RAM usage. So the slider going up isn't enough. There's certain EC2s that we can get that are specifically made for really high RAM usage, right? Just like you buy CPUs that have high GPUs for doing data science, you know, you can't really do that for Lambda. So you can just move the slider and get more power. So it's just nice to say, all right, well, we'll use that in batch and then we'll manage the whole thing in step functions. So we have like 90% in serverless, but the beefy part for this, you know, file parsing can scale, you know, independently because the Lambdas don't care about moving and encrypting whatever. They can do all that and stream all that data. But the actual parsing is hard, it's CPU intensive, and we may have to throw more servers at it, bigger servers, more servers, horizontally, whatever. And so that's that's a hybrid example. Another one would be streaming data has no trigger. So like we talked about, fine. Make the streaming data a server that listens on a WebSocket, but then it pushes to a FIFO queue for SQS, or it forwards your logs to Kinesis, and then you parse those with Lambda, right? So hybrid architectures can work really well. Time limit. I don't think it's a problem. I think it's opportunity to solve a lot of these things like make a half the zip file or concurrently save all these files to each write to Dynamo DB within your write capacity constraints. Maybe you batch 10 at a time, things like that. There's a lot of algorithms that can be sliced. It can be challenging based on what language you use, based on library availability, but when it is a problem, think of these three things. You can break operations in a single idempotent operation. So like parsing a file. If you know that file has breakpoints, right, then you can do it. Things like JSON and CVS are traditionally thought of as you just go JSON parse or CVS parse. No, no one thinks about like streaming that in. So there are some cases, especially in CSV in some cases, where you can do streaming architectures where you parse like rows, right? So maybe just parse row one through 10, but you know, the other ones are handled by some other Lambda. You're just given an index range of an array of operations to parse and then somebody else handles the other ones. That someone else is 90 of your other Lambda friends helping you out, right? And the order of operations doesn't matter because at the end, the step function can put it together. So you think about that, break these operations up into large, you know, teaching chunks and then horizontally scale it. it could be Lambda, could be step functions, could be SQS, whatever. Um, manage loops and maps via step functions. So step functions have basic looping functionality, which basically means think of a for loop that has retry. Think of a for loop that has retry, not just for like errors, but like, oh, it took too long. Or you ran out of IP addresses. Or uh, we're going to wait five minutes because you're probably deploying. So we'll just try again, <laughs> right? Or that for loop is waiting for a user to approve something. Like all kinds of that. So think of it like that. But also the maps are very important because the maps and step functions have controllable concurrency. So for example, if you look at Bluebird, Bluebird is a library for JavaScript promises that enhances them to have all kinds of capabilities. And one in particular is that if you have 100 promises that are making HTTP calls, that means whatever server you're hitting is doing about 
100 HTTP calls at a time based on your browser, the network output, et cetera. What if you're doing it from a backend and you have all the resources, whatever? You don't want to inundate that downstream server. So what you do is you say, I'll make three calls at a time. That's a lot of code to write. Or you can say max concurrency three in Bluebird promise, and it'll take 100 of those promises and only ever execute three at a time to make sure that you're not going above the SLA or the service level agreement that you made for that downstream API, right? Maps and step functions do that. They're like a loop, but they only do three at a time. Or they could do one at a time, right? It's up to you to control that. So if you're taking data, you have to write to Dynamo. That can be really, really powerful. So in that time limit, that's okay. Sometimes you can do your work really quick on a Lambda and then let the step function handle orchestrating all these other dudes that only do something for like one second, but you do maybe 300 at the same time. Or you do 300, but only three at a time, right? Think of it like that. Step functions can really help offload that time problem big time. And then if you don't have step functions, you can use Lambda callback pattern where Lambdas call themselves. It's what we did before step functions were a thing. All right, development. So this is huge. The first thing I want to say is that AWS Dev has no best practice yet. So there's a ton of opinions, a ton of tools, and there's also preferences. People might not like the best practice, and that's fine because software best practices are not all really best practices. Like they're best practices for you, but not for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like a lot of times they're just, they're considered best practice, but they don't make sense, right? Like, like a lot of my favorite are what's well, the best practice to do X and ESLint. Well, hold on. Like ESLint is super opinionated. Python has PEP, right? PEP, like it, the language has a standard. Why are there seven linters? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, doesn't that not, you know, make sense? That kind of stuff. Um, so just be aware. So infrastructure is config plus little code. There's Terraform. People like writing this like action script to style oop config, almost like a Python data class style Terraform. And then they have Terraform plan, Terraform apply. And then if it blows up, they have to go to the S3 bucket and delete the state file. Like people enjoy that. I think that is the worst thing on the planet, but it underpins a lot of what I use. So I don't really have a choice sometimes. Um, I think it's dumb. Ansible is the worst because it uses YAML. So Python part of Ansible is neato because that's real infrastructure as code. But the YAML part, like what, who thought that was a good idea? Clearly someone who's never used the YAML. I didn't tab, my whole server broke. Like that's what happens, man, it's ridiculous. CloudFormation. CloudFormation is neat because you can have a, uh, a bunch of stuff as a deployable unit with built-in big time and rollback. Like AWS is really cool like that, but it's slow and it uses YAML. <laughs> so you can do JSON, but like, it's just, I don't know, man. They all are the most frustrating thing ever. So I, I don't like infrastructure as these things. I get as code. AWS CDK is a start, but unfortunately they went TypeScript and OOP. There's no state in infrastructure as code. I don't know what you're doing. So like for some reason they should use functions, but like no one in TypeScript does functional programming. I don't know. Frameworks. So there's the serverless framework to build serverless. Then there's, but it's all like JavaScript. Then there's CDK where you code in TypeScript, you can deploy in anything. So you can deploy your Python code, whatever code. But a lot of people like the CDK because they like TypeScript. I like the CDK because you can write step functions as code and you can do some logic, which a lot of times for environments, it's really helpful. AWS SAM is amazing because it was one of the first to make creating service applications easy. It had a command line and a deployment as a single monolith deployment, but all your stuff is a deployable unit and you can see it in serverless applications. You can see it in CloudFormation, in the Lambda. It's like, it's amazing, right? The source code, the worst. Amplify, another one for UIs. I can't really use Amplify and Service Framework because it assumes like you're, you have account level access and your IAM roles can do anything. And it's, it's not how it works in enterprise companies. So those frameworks are really neat and have a lot to offer and they all have niches, but you gotta be careful what, when you use based on your IAM role, your security groups, sometimes you have cloud teams that handle and manage those things. You're not allowed to create that yourself. And so a lot of these things just don't have the access controls that you would expect from a large company. And sometimes the source code is very strange. <laughs> like some of the plugins for serverless framework are really cool and really strange. Um, so yeah, a lot of the frameworks I think have helped a lot. Like Sam for us has worked well. As much as I hate YAML, as much as I bash CloudFormation, I think Sam worked out really well. I definitely encourage you to look at some of these frameworks because they're not just kids experimenting. Like they really solve a lot of business problems. Um, I just 
I'm not passionate about all of them. So the AWS console is actually good enough for some people. They can actually code in Lambda all day. They're fine with coding in a browser. I don't understand that like at all, but that they would rather do that than like figure out how to install the AWS CLI. Now the CLI is relatively easy to install. Installing Python is not. <laughs> so my empathy goes out to them. So I understand why. Um, some people don't know that there's other ways to do it. The AWS CLI is like the most de facto standard of like, you should always do this first. Like this is the first thing you should do is brew install Python, then install the ABC SDK, right? Get your keys set up. Like the world is your oyster when you have that. I don't even like Unix. I don't even like command line development. I'm awful at it, but I have the CLI, <laughs> right? So even an art student uses that thing. Um, Docker is not needed for serverless development. Okay, but I acknowledge A, you can use it for a lot of good effect. B, it helps a lot of people out for like testing set functions locally, testing their APIs locally. And three, sometimes you inherited code, you don't have a choice. So I get it, right? But you don't need it. You don't need Docker. You can just write code in Node or write code in Python, test it locally, deploy it in Lambda, invoke it with your Node and JavaScript and Python or with the AWS CLI and test your code. You don't need Docker for any of that stuff but you can use it and we can still be friends. CSCD dominates the workflow. So I found that everybody, if you go back up to the, the frameworks, everybody uses a different way to deploy, which means how you're doing continuous integration and continuous deployment affects how you do serverless. So your views of serverless, how you test serverless and develop is a symptom of what your company's or startup CSCD process is. So, I've just found that the development is crazy. Sometimes we'll work around it because the CSCD process is so bad and you're okay with configuration drift because it takes too long to run a build. I think it shouldn't take more than four seconds to upload a Lambda. And these, some of these Jenkins builds take like five to 10 minutes. It's like, dude, I'm testing one line of code. What are you doing? AWS space, Lambda space, update function, point to your code or zip it. Like if you have node modules, like what, what are these people doing? Um, yeah, and lastly, the disconnect between dev and CCD is just, yeah, big thing, man. All right, so lambda list. I, I, I'm, I talked about this earlier. But basically, the desire to run the server locally is just because people come from the API world. They're building the APIs, like Spring Boot or ExpressJS or Flask or Django and Python. Like that's, they think of this monolith, like APIs kind of scenario. I'm doing it with functional runtime. So I get it. But they think that they need to run everything locally, right? And it's like, well, the input, for Lambda is like a JSON object. And they're like, no, 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 no. Like Express already handled parsing web requests. I'm like, this isn't a web request, it's a JSON. I'm like, yeah, I know, but it comes from API Gateway or an ALB, right? So it's a web request. I'm like, dude, it's like got three properties. You can parse it yourself. Well, you know, I really shouldn't be parsing it myself when a framework's already solved it five years. I'm like, no, the framework solved it for like native network calls, not JSON inputs that are really simple to parse. Like, so disconnect there. Um, using things like Docker to support and Sam and local stack, we just talked about Docker, like they have good support for API development to do that. So if that's your thing and you're developing APIs, you can do that. But again, it's, it's around this model of thinking. And I think like Jan C said, I agree with him. It is the best way to learn. You should encourage Lambda lists if you don't know what you're doing. It is like the best way to learn and you can't hurt yourself. It's not a foot gun, right? Using the express plugin or the Python plugins to make your API work in a stateless environment, that's fine. Like having a, a concept of like, server startup, take a request and we'll really shut down. Like the PHP days of old, that's fantastic. So do that. Testability. So unit testing is your code in your machine or your server. So you should be able to unit test your code. Basically for a Lambda, that just means you throw in some JSON and you expect some response out. That could be JSON. That could be an exception, right? Whatever your language fits, that's fine. But you should be able to unit test locally. you will be able to turn your wireless off and it always works. Integration would be your code is deployed to AWS. So integration or end-to-end -end or acceptance, I'm gonna kind of blur the lines because we're talking about backend stuff. All those are together, okay? So when we talk about integration, that's what we mean. So you can call AWS services and code from your local machine. So if you wanna do integration tests, they should be able to work on your machine. You can call, like you can go like, I don't know, Python, let's just do behave. So you can type behave and your Python code should be able to invoke all your AWS stuff, both locally and remotely. And that should be fine, right? That's, there's nothing wrong with that. So even simple things such as I want to run my Lambda locally. You do not need Docker. You do not need SAM. You do not need the CDK. You literally can go node index.js, 
or Python index pi. And all of those languages have the ability to know if you're calling them via the command line. So you can put JSON inputs that would emulate the front end. Sam can generate all the local stubs for you. If you want to do real ones, like an API, that's fine. Sam can generate that. But you can also just like when a file comes on your bucket, you can see the trigger come from SQS and it can trigger your Lambda. You could run it locally. You can listen for it. You can listen for SQS messages. So a lot of this stuff you can run locally. Not all of it, but a lot of it. Obviously, Dynamo, you're not going to run locally. You can if you want to use local stack. That's your stick. That's fine. But most of this stuff you can run locally. So when we talk about testing your deployed code from your local machine, you can deploy it and then test it. You can invoke your lambdas. You can invoke your SQS, whether you're using command line for the AWS CLI or your language. Like if you're using JavaScript or Python or Rust or whatever, like they have AWS SDKs and you can call it. Um, when you you invoke a Lambda locally, it should be the same remotely. Like the only difference between a Lambda remotely invoked and locally is security groups and IAM roles, right? Same JSON input, but they can't do things remotely that they can do locally. And namely that's because of security groups and IAM roles. So that, that kind of stuff's why you want to do re remote tests. Sometimes you're just literally testing they can actually work, right? Um, yeah, and step functions can be tested locally, but in my experience, it's faster to test remotely. So you're going to find that some services, it's just faster to test them remotely. You'll, it just depends. All right. So when we talk about remote testing, what we mean by remote testing is how do I test my lambdas are deployed? Am I testing one? Am I testing a bunch? Am I using a step function to test all of them at once? Am I hitting a bunch of URLs that invoke those lambdas? How do I test all these things? And you want to expose that in some way. If you have a Lambda that's only invoked by an S3 trigger, find another way, either a trigger or Lambda invoke as part of the IAM role or something that you believe is safe to allow you to test it and see if it works. It could just be, I wanna see logs every five minutes in CloudWatch, whatever you think is best. You need to provide a way to test your service infrastructure consistently on the back end. So whenever you deploy code, you know that it works. And we're not talking about your code, like just your Lambda itself. Like, does it execute? Does it write log as the CloudWatch, right? All these pieces, you want to see it work. It's not about your code. It's about the code working in a serverless environment. And deployed step functions the same way. My step functions, I treat them very similar to Lambdas, where they have the ability to run in a just quick dry run fashion, where like I can execute. I can execute, and I can see these Lambdas. I can execute, I can write to CloudWatch like that kind of stuff. I can give you feedback. You want to be able to have an ability to quickly invoke those things and see them. So sometimes making triggers and removing triggers is actually really helpful. Like for example, if you're doing green blue deployments and you're actually switching between a green trigger and a blue trigger on a bucket to point to a blue Lambda and a blue a green Lambda, having the ability to automate that switching of triggers, creating, adding, removing, including the permissions, you can automate that away. Right, it could just be shell scripts, it could be Terraform, Ansible, whatever. But the point is you want to think about how you can test that as part of your pipeline. You're testing your infrastructure that's remotely deployed. So I use AWS SDK to do that with the CLI. Some people write code for it. You can do it in JavaScript, Python, doesn't matter. Just the point is keep that in mind. You want to be able to remotely test that as part of your CCD. So deployments, all right, I'm not I'm the worst person to talk about this, but it does affect me. So I want to bring it up. Terraform. I care about cloud agnosticism, or I just like OOP data class style configuration. That's what the Terraform people are, and that's just how they work. And like, I don't like. I I'm an AWS kid. I'm completely devoted to AWS. I love it. It's fun. It's my new shtick, man. I mean, I'm still a UI guy, but I love building stuff. I and mean, it's really fun. And I don't care about Docker and cloud agnosticism. Like, I'll use CloudFormation if that's what AWS wants me to do, <laughs> right? Um, the reason I don't like Terraform though, is because the state files, like if they break, you've got to delete them and start over and your Terraform plan doesn't understand what's going on. You have to restart and it's just, it's very frustrating. So I, maybe if you've gotten improved, I don't know, but I just, I don't, it's slow and I don't enjoy it. Uh, Lambda microservice. So Lambdas are not always a microservice. Sometimes they truly are, um, just functions. And if you're deploying independent services, that's good. That means that you can deploy them independently and you don't break downstream systems, whether you have built-in versioning, whether you have API contracts, whatever that is. But sometimes your Lambda microservices are part of a bounded context or part of an app. And so you can't independently deploy them because like 
they have dependencies on others on purpose. And that's where things like AWS SAM, serverless applications, and even just CloudFormation general templates, where you have a unit of deployed code, that's fine. And there's APIs for that too. You can have versioning and rollbacks and all that other stuff. So it's not always Lambda's microservice. So when you think about deployments, don't correlate the two because that's that can be dangerous. Um, slow pipelines means you avoid them. So this is just my experience from DevOps in general is that if you have people that say you have to get 100% test coverage, developers will do a lot of crazy stuff that is not good. It's not just like silly. Some of it's actively bad. It's putting bad things in the code base to up your coverage numbers, right? And so this is the same thing. Slow pipelines encourage that same negative behavior that we will work around it. We will actively encourage configuration drift just to get away from a slow pipeline. So it's something that really negatively affects. And it's it seems to be a problem across the industry, but I've just found even with serverless, it's, it's the same problem. If I can't deploy a Lambda in under four seconds, then I'll, I'll do it myself. I'll find a way with a shell script and I'll ignore Jenkins or whatever backend thing we're using. Uh, configuration drift is exacerbated though, in that if you don't have that automated, you'll start having different lambdas and different service applications deployed differently. So definitely, definitely need to keep your configuration between environments like under control. Examples would be like you're creating IAM roles for your specific services, right? So you have one IAM role and one um, permission per like SQS and step functions and lambda have their own, for example. Like you need to keep that organized per environment, and it's it's hard especially when it's either JSON or AWS CLI. So sometimes Terraform and Ansible can help there, CloudFormation, et cetera. Um, I like Jan Suiz. He's got a quote I'm going to butcher, but he he says, if you don't know him, he's like a really cool serverless guy. He teaches, he works at Lamigo, I think. He's got a CLI for that company. He's got a lot of good advice on Twitter, but what I he does classes, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, what I liked was his microservices with monolith deployments, right? That's what it, it really comes down to is that you have microservices or even just small functions, but it's in a mono repo and you've got each one is a small little code base and you can independently deploy them or deploy them all at once. Same code base, same deployment, lots of flexibility. Like that's, that's the ideal situation of blending the best of both worlds, right? And so you can encourage, you know, even microservice practices where you have like the API contracts and things like that or the versioning, whatever, but that, that's where you should start. Not everything has to be an independently deployed entity from an independent GitHub repo. Uh, serverless applications. So a lot of people don't know about this. Serverless applications are not, it's not a phrase. It's an actual navigation thing in the AWS console. When you go to Lambda, you'll see Lambda functions. You click functions. Right below it is applications. Now, yes, you're going to still have 50 browser tabs open, but you can see your entire app and all its pieces right there and even monitor it right there. It's amazing. You have a group deployment, your app is this, and you can name it. The reason that's important is you can go green blue or you can go QA dev or staging or whatever. So really, really simple, really powerful thing that a lot of people don't know about. Serverless applications are a thing and you can deploy them with SAM or CDK or both. Some people mix the two tools. Uh, QA and Pride is often different accounts. I've never... It seems to work out really well, but it's you really should invest in creating your own accounts quickly. So, for example, if a developer has his own his or her own account, like, dude, that's so helpful because then your resources don't affect others. Your costs are controlled to that particular developer. And again, I'm not a con cost consultant for AWS, but having that independently deployment guarantees that it works across accounts. So in the olden days, we used to think of like the QA server, the dev server. Now we're thinking about QA and product accounts. Now, they, those don't really differ except for what you deploy, specifically security groups, IAM roles, <laughs> okay? So those two things are a big deal, which means that QA and prod, it's, it's, they can be on the same account, that's fine, but it's better if you have different accounts. I, I know it's hard to do in big companies, I get it. Um, so dev and QA can be different service applications. Though. So it's not just you have a different like set of lambdas, you could have a set of green lambdas and a set of blue lambdas, a, green, a set of... Um, you know, blue dynamo tables that talk to the green table. So like they, like they don't talk to each other is what my point is. They're independently deployed units. Okay. Sometimes you don't want to deploy your database tables because they're going to stay forever and the data is there and it's a completely different deployment. That's fine. But the green and blue can still be independent in how it talks to that. And you can, you know, do triggers and route 53 and all that stuff to route that stuff. So just be aware that a lot of that service application gives you a lot of flexibility from deployment perspective. API gateway. I don't have access to it. I obviously at home I do, right? I do YouTube videos on it. It's fun. But my point is like, 
you can make a URL wired to anything, <laughs> which is so cool. Like SQS, message buses, lambdas, step functions. Now you can literally like orchestrate your micro, like complicated microservices with step functions. Like what? It's so sick. So all that means is where you would normally use API Gateway, you basically use an, an ALB, you go to a Lambda and have it do things that you would normally wire that up to. That, that's, that's really the only change, right? So if you don't have it, you use a Lambda. That's, that's often what you do. If you ever get to use API Gateway, you can just remove that Lambda, right? Because there's probably not a lot of business logic there anyway, and it just routes right to your service. Now, sometimes the responses are a big deal. Do you return a 500? Do you return a 429 or 400? Right. Sometimes that lambda is actually more advantageous, but API Gateway has all kinds of you know knobs to tweak what the responses are. So just be aware that there's a lot of services that you can't always use in AWS. And this is where serverless can sometimes come down where, well, we can't use synthetics, so I guess we're gonna have to continue to use our Selenium grid, <laughs> right? Or our puppeteer grid. Or we use Cypress, so we don't care. You know what I mean? So just be aware there's a lot of times where you can't use AWS services and sometimes this is serverless and sometimes you have a hybrid where some of your things are serverless and some aren't because you just don't have authorization to use it, right? Resource limits. So this is one thing I've, I've uh, I'll give you two examples of two projects. Parsing large files. The old mentality was that you use a really beefy EC2. The new mentality is that you can use 10 beefy lambdas and you just sequence or parallelize the work. So for example, if you are parsing a 50 gig file and it's in one gigabyte chunks, then each one can do a byte range fetch. That means, hey, S3, I only want the first gig of this file. Just give me the first gig of bytes. Gig of bytes, okay? And then the Lambda can process that. Lambda number two can get the second gig of bytes and then process just that. So when you think about that, then all of those can do it at the same time. So the reverse is true as well. If you're uploading large files, a lot of times uploading large files in a browser, you don't. What you do is you upload chunks of it to be safe. It just so happens that S3 supports uploading parts. So you take five megabytes of, of the, like let's say an 80 meg file, you upload that. And if it works, cool, you keep going. If it fails, you retry. So that way you don't have to start the whole file over, right? Because they already have those parts. And so the UI can query for that and S3 manages all that state. And you let S3 put it back together again. So the old way is use a beef EC2. Now you just have S3 and Lambda if you want to reassemble that file and parse that file, it can only do that one particular part. It doesn't have to get the whole file. So a lot of flexibility with parts of uploading files, not just downloading and processing files. Step functions can help a ton with a lot of the stuff above. So if you're trying to do a lot of work and orchestrate it and retry it on the back end, not on the front end in the browser, step functions can orchestrate that using for loops and maps to make that chunk of work to deal with these resource limits. So a lot of people go, why, why don't you just use a server? I'm like, hold on, there's a lot of advantage of not having to manage that. Instead, I can make the code work in smaller chunks and then have 50 of them work at the same time. So that solves not just my server problem, I don't have to maintain that anymore, but I also don't have to solve the concurrency problem. So in Node, you stop using promise.all. You just go, do the work, but it does the work that came from the input. <laughs> and so each one of these lambdas is doing different work. So you don't need PM2, you don't need forever, right? You don't need to communicate between node processes. AWS will handle that. You just spawn 50 lambdas at the same time. Um, and the, some of the old ways work too, okay? So to give an example, like Go, Rust, JVM, they're powerful. And sometimes that 15 minutes, you can do a lot in a lambda in 15 minutes. Examples are like soap. <laughs> so we're using Go to parse massive amounts of soap. And it's a beast. It takes like six minutes, but... Imagine doing that with JavaScript, right? Go is concurrently looking at all these nodes and putting all these you know things together. So you can you can leverage that. That's what's so cool about the the one selling point of microservices, right? Was that each independent service could use a different language. You can do the same thing with these little lambda functions. Sometimes their their services are smaller than a microservice. Like they're what did serverless used to call them? Pico servers. The point is they're so small you can use a language that's appropriate for what that function is doing. He's parsing the file. This guy's reading a file. He's reading like the first part. No one cares. You could write that in Ruby. But parsing a massive file, like go do that, right? Or Java or Rust or, you know, whatever. So debugging is, is interesting. And this is just something I'm still learning myself. But Node.js has a local code debugger. So does Python. So I can debug my code locally with breakpoints. 
I use a lot of console log and print statements, yes. But if you wanted to, you can do it pretty straightforward with a tutorial to debug it locally. You can do the same thing when you deploy your Lambda remotely. It has a debugger and you can connect to it. I, I never use it, but people do. So CloudWatch, it works great for functions, but it's horrible for Lambda lives. When your logs get so big, it's very difficult to navigate. If you ever use Splunk or Elk, especially Splunk, like the search features are just better it's depending upon who hosts it, it's faster, right? So it's just easier to find what you're looking for in a large block of logs and then start from that point forward and go down. CloudWatch, it's just hard. So for little itty bitty functions, super great. And you can open each independent function and have its CloudWatch log stream and look at just that stream for just that function. And then sometimes they tell a story. Sometimes you don't care about the story. You're just like, this function's breaking. Everything else is fine. So I, that's one problem I've had is that CloudWatch works great for really small functions, but whatever. So in my experience, it's better to log than explode. So what I mean by that is if you know something's wrong or you're going to have an exception and you're going to obey right, the Lambda contract of input, output, or input, explode, that's fine. Log it. it it's better to over log. So you know why, because you want insight. Because again, you can't like see the crash logs. Like you can't go Docker PS, get that ID, and then Docker logs, <laughs> right? You're looking at CloudWatch. So logs are the only way to figure out what's really going on in Lambda for the most part, if you're not using like X-ray or something. Um, a function, you need to be very strategic about your logs because you don't want to have so many logs in your CloudWatch, it's hard to read. You don't want to be navigating CloudWatch. It's not fun at all. The filters are frustrating. And it's not all loggers make it JSON, which makes it harder to read sometimes. Sometimes JSON is like happy for the logger, but horrible for the developer. If you print like normal English, it's a lot easier to read the logs, but then like it goes on multiple lines and then you got longer pages. So yeah, it's, there's not much of a happy medium. Now, if you're doing a Lambda lift, you want to be very tactical about how you're doing basically <clears throat> only things of interest. So if you have like 50 exceptions, you can't connect an HTTP, no one cares. Just say I can't connect and here's why, right? So that stuff is hard. It's just practice. You want to hopefully exploit that stuff locally first so you can see it in your console. Verbose exception and lambdas really help your step function. There are some errors that you can actually like handle specifically inside of step functions. I've tried and failed multiple times. I, I always take the opposite approach. I basically say, all right, any error happens, retry. Except these two errors don't retry, right? So whatever exception type you throw inside of your Lambda, whatever language, you can catch that inside of step functions and react accordingly. It's kind of like pattern matching, right? Um, in batch, batch doesn't return anything. It's idempotent, which is very frustrating. So batch logs, you want to be as verbose as possible because that's like an ECS cluster that doesn't live forever, right? So you can make it live forever in SSH in those boxes, but dude, you totally don't want to. Um, yeah, and I've seen people do this. I've tried this and I've been kind of successful, sort of. Um, baking UIs and CLIs to visualize your flow of messages. So I'm giving an example like SQS, but it doesn't matter. Whatever data flow in your app, if you don't have visualization, make one, right? You have the logs, you have the data, you have the event bridge, you have the events, you have SQS. As long as you don't put, put the, like take the message off the queue for like forever, you can visualize it, right? And you can use the ADBS SDK to visualize all this stuff. You don't have to use Datadog and their built-in dashboards for everything. So CLIs and UIs to query your infrastructure helps a lot. It's not just an ABS thing. And I, DLQs are, you need to make those things easy to work with. Like they keep saying log to DLQ or your DLQ has why it failed. Okay, what do I do with those failures? How do I replay them? Like you need to like early on cause that play with it, feel comfortable, and then build some kind of solution that's comfortable for you around that, right? To deal with those. Sometimes you're just looking at logs and that's all right. But bottom line is fight for item potency. You want to make sure that your serverless stuff can run multiple times and it's not a big deal. Security groups. So what is the ingress and what is the, the egress? How, who can talk to who? 99.999% of the time when you make a call in Lambda and it hangs forever, right? And so your Lambda times out. It's because of security groups. Security groups, you would think, oh, security, stop. That's not what it does. It goes, what's up, dog? And like, it just stands there and stares at you. Like those, those soldiers in the UK who just like stare straight. <laughs> like that's what it is. It's so frustrating. So if they time out, it's probably security groups. So you want to have a, an easy ability to have integration tests where you can verify that adding security groups broke the thing, not changing code, or removing security groups fixed the thing. 
right? Very, very helpful. So this is where things like ping and health come in. Now, when I say slash ping, I don't always mean the API. I mean, literally, if the JSON that comes in the Lambda equals, equals, equals the string ping, or it's, you know, a, a route like method equals or J, custom JSON or whatever has the word ping in it, whatever your trigger is, right? That it could be a ping file you drop on the S3 bucket and it triggers the Lambda with the ping file and you're like, oh, this is a ping. So however you do that input of the lamp, doesn't matter. It detects that JSON the ping, it'll say, I work. Like super important to know your lambdas can actually execute, right? I am roles, things like that. But health is helpful to test security because health means, oh, I'm not only executing, I'm also gonna attempt to check the health and my access to other things. Can I make an egress HTTP call with this IP on this you know, port to this service or not? Can I make it, but I can't get a response back? These are really important for integration tests, and so they help a ton. Um, and you want to have the quick ability to add and remove them. <laughs> so if you don't have access to like, you know, add and remove security groups, and you have to like do a new cloud formation deployment, like that's miserable. Get admin access, get in that lambda, break it, and test it, and confirm that in a, like a QA account, right? Very quickly. You don't want to spend a lot of time messing around with this stuff. I am roles, same thing. Basically, main reason is that you have integration tests because they're worse. <laughs> so it's one thing to make an HP call. It's another thing where your lambda is like, I can't invoke or I can't send logs to CloudWatch to tell you what's wrong with me. Like that is the worst. And IAM roles do this all the time. The rules change underneath you. And so when you deploy your code, you run a test against it. Sometimes the tests are strictly to test IAM roles. Can you read from a bucket? Yes. Can you delete from a bucket? No. Well, dude, I, I need that. Well, it's not your IAM role. Okay. So a um, good thing I had the ability to test deleting a file in a bucket to know it didn't work anymore. Right, this is why you have unit tests and integration tests to verify this stuff still works. Yeah, your tests should be tightly integrated with your health. You wanna verify the most important access there. So you don't have to delete, but if you don't test, it'll break and you won't know. In my opinion, your acceptance test should run through every single possible IAM role access you can. So if you need to read and write from a bucket, then have your integration test do that. So identifying latency is interesting, not just from an API perspective, but from like, when you start building these distributed architectures, who is the slow person here? Is there a slow person? What is slow, right? You need to have that. And like AWS X-Ray solves like at least 90% of the problem. You can visualize the entire tree. So if you ever use the network tab in the browser, which is kind of horizontal, it's like a waterfall. Think of it like that, except it's hugely vertical and you scroll forever. You can see all your step functions, all your lambdas calling each other, all the HTTP calls. You can even add additional metrics in your SDK to enable that, to make it easier to read. They, it's just X-ray is the best. So I really like that. Datadog can help on individuals. I think Datadog has probably, at least at the time of this video, some of the best visualizations that you get an account with Datadog and you wire your AWS data to it and it visualizes in charts and dashboards. Then you can set up monitors. That's fine, but the charts really can, can show you over time particular services that have latency. And I found that really helpful to look at individuals. So X-ray at least in time of this video, I can't really drill down particulars onto a particular service or just I want to see SQS over time where this, you can definitely look at time time frames in the past. Super, super helpful. Um, AWS Grass can help though. Um, there's a way to use the AWS SDK. It has metrics for a variety of SDKs to enable like Go, Python, JavaScript. You can enable that. But more importantly, you can do EMF, which is a, a a uh, small set of metrics that you can add around your functions that make your graphs a little more intelligent of when a call was made, when a call was stopped, what the data size was, things like that, number specific things. And so it, it's a little bit of code, but it helps make your graphs a little more intelligible for some of those metrics. So it, it's an enhancement aside of X-Ray, right? It helps with the latency. So, um, and lastly, a lot of the latency things that could be solved are people don't know that if you have 50 lambdas, sometimes it's actually only 30 servers. So you actually have like a few servers running the same lambda multiple times. So if you put code like import statements and libraries and database connections above the handler, it'll reuse those things. Sometimes that's desirable. Sometimes with database handlers, it's not. So if you have reserved concurrency, which you mean like only have 10 functions run ever, you only want 10 database connections ever, right? So think about that. But usually the idea is to put it above the handler and reuse it. All right, concurrency is a big one. So let's let's take a breath and talk about why this is important.
important because it will change your career. It'll change how you view programming languages and which ones you choose on purpose for employment opportunities. It's a big deal. So Elixir or Erlang, whatever, has Beam. It's the runtime engine. And it's very, very popular. People use Elixir, not just for Elixir, but they use it for Beam. That They want access, the ability to do this massive horizontal concurrency, right? That's the ideal. Java Scala has Alka. So you already have JVM, but now you have a, a way to create super, super small processes, very similar to Elixir, that watch for crashes and restart, right? Same actor model mentality. Wonderful, wonderful thing. But you could also have money just funnel to land with provisioning. <laughs> So like, let me give an example. If I need to do 100 things in Node.js, I will then like do a, an array or for loop or a map, and I will create those 100 jobs. I'll then go promise.all, I'll put that list in there, and then I'll go dot then. And that dot then will fire when those 100 jobs are complete. That's how you do concurrency in Node, right? In Python, you'd use gather, maybe async await, or maybe thread pool. In Java, you know, in Elixir, you would spawn 100 processors or some kind of supervisors and messages. Or you could just have an input that does one thing and have a step function manage that. So suddenly you're not managing the concurrency. So instead of using code to tweak the knobs, you're just using configuration in AWS. And there's a couple reasons you would do that. Now, as someone who doesn't like ops and doesn't like YAML and configuration languages, right? You're like, Jesse, why would you offload that to like the AWS? What's the point? point is, is that their stuff works all the time. And if it doesn't, it's usually because of IP addresses or resources constraints. If you're using something like step functions to manage it, it's retry as a service. So those problems kind of go away by themselves. They self heal because you're using retry as a service. And also you have some flexibility to tweak the JSON and how that works. But take the reverse view. Your code suddenly becomes super, super simple. It doesn't have any concurrency. It does an input and output. It does one thing or maybe three things and that's it. So testing it's easier, reasoning about it in six months after you haven't looked at it in six months is easier, right? And it goes from like 200 lines of code to 300. So a big ball of mud goes away. So suddenly a lot of your, you'll find that concurrency sometimes, not always in Go, I know, you, it becomes a lot easier to read. Those concurrency problems go away and you offload it to AWS to handle the scalability right from horizontally. So sometimes there, there's advantages there to make your code simpler because you're offloading those do multiple things in a sequence or do multiple things at once, right? With a step function loop or map. So JavaScript has promise all settled, right? Do a bunch of things. If some failed, whatever, just tell me when they're all done. Python has gather, which kind of does the same thing, but AWS has step functions and they can retry for a year, right? So you don't, you don't have to wait. And unlike promises, you can add a timeout. <laughs> so step functions have some advantages there of like, we try a bunch of things, we retried these things, and all of them worked, or all of them worked except for this one. And here's, here's how long it took, we stopped waiting after X amount of time. Like, having that level of control around your concurrency and, and being able to understand it, right? <laughs> seeing it visually, very quickly, without having to swim through cloud watch logs to know what the heck's going on with your code while it's deployed, right? Because it's not doing the same thing deployed that it's doing remotely, like locally in a machine. That's amazing. Like that's absolutely amazing. So step functions and some of these things will give you tools to visualize how your concurrency is going. So another thing, JavaScript has PM2 or forever, and it uses with a cluster module to allow node to spawn an additional cluster per CPU or a vCPU, right? Virtual CPU. And so that particular main master node will talk to all the children and that's fine. But like, ECS often only has like a single core anyway, and the EC2s with Docker are self-healing. So like you don't need the node cluster module. Like just put node in a Docker and if it crashes, it'll give you a new one. It doesn't cost anything. It's not a big deal. Like that's the point of ECS, right? You have three Docker containers. If this dies, it'll send traffic to these two and then spawn a new one. Self-healing, right? So like a lot of that concurrency stuff you don't need because they just manages it. You know what I mean? And Go has simple concurrency, okay? I'm not going to deny that. But SQS can batch 10 messages at a time. And it'll handle retry. And if it doesn't work, it'll retry again. And if it doesn't, it'll put all the failures in it. DLQ, which then you can replay if you want to. And it doesn't have state because they're like input outputs. So you don't have to do mutable state with concurrency like you do in Go. <laughs> so I know Go developers like 
what's wrong with mutable state and concurrency? There's nothing wrong. But the functional people are like, dude, this is so so amazing, right? So a lot of that concurrency stuff that AWS handles, you don't need to use the native functionality in the language anymore. And so that's why like things like Elixir and Akka, I just stop caring about because I can do all that stuff in serverless. I can like spawn 50 lambdas or I can control it with map with the max concurrency or I can dynamically resize my write capability for Dynamo, inject the data, then shut it down and I don't pay for it while it's idle. Like all those things are just, you know, amazing around the ability to do multiple things at once. But AWS gives you the knobs to twist and that's just makes the code simpler. I like how the code gets less and less about concurrency and more focused on doing one thing well. I like that a lot. All right, this one's kind of wishy-washy. <laughs> Last one, compromising. So I like servers, okay? Have fun with your bi-weekly AMI updates that break your logging, Docker OS security findings, rehydration, stateful architectures, and slow builds. Like that's a cliche, Jesse attacking, you know, something that other people love, right? And there, it's not that I just don't like servers. It's that I don't want to work with servers because I don't like servers. So instead of me saying that, I say, you're a threat because you're saying, well, your servers might be better and you might convince my manager and he might force me to use a server, right? That's where that's coming from. So a lot of times you have to compromise and say, look, there are certain opportunities where servers can help. Other times they can't. And that's fine, but you can write stateless code and deploy it. And sometimes you'll be okay, right? You can use batch and turn it on all the time. So instead of like taking two minutes to spawn up a temporary EC2 ECS cluster and then shut it down, you can just keep it on all day, <laughs> right? So you can execute jobs that you want this cluster to do. So there's, there's some interesting use cases for that because then if you have a server up all day that's kind of serverless, then you can deploy simple little Docker containers that do your jobs, such as talking to a socket server and sending messages downstream to a serverless option, right, a trigger. So this is ones that I've I found a challenge in teaching is that I have good tools. Why would I do a distributed architecture? So for example, I like Node.js. I like TypeScript. It's working really well for me. Why would I use AWS SAM and break all these little pieces up into little AWS Lambda functions? And I'm like, do you think your code base is a big ball of mud? They're like, no, I follow CACD. I have good TDD, right? I have good test and play. We have a good CACD pipeline. The monolith's working well for us. So like in that case, they don't see the benefits of doing that. And, and this is where a lot of people say, start with the monolith. Like even Martin Fowler, like start with the monolith, refactor when there's a piece of it that's complicated. You do not want to start with a distributed architecture. I often wonder if the step functions and lambdas and SAM and serverless applications really are distributed architectures because they are distributed and they all have different lambda functions. But it's all about making the code bases smaller, right? So if you have good tools in place, I've still seen large code bases not be fun for anyone. And even if you start small, they always grow. So having the ability to separate them out and to make them super teeny, so only the largest they could possibly grow is maybe 100 lines of code, like that's amazing. And it's you get much less cognitive overhead if you're dealing with just this 100 lines of code, but you get more overhead trying to bring it all together sometimes. So the monolith for a lot of people is good and you need to compromise like and acknowledge. And I think that was the hardest thing for me for after I got it. And I'm like, dude, we should stop doing these monoliths because it's, AWS has made it so easy to do these really distributed deployments and, and debug them and see latencies is great. And they're like, I know, but this is working for us and it's really simple to grok. Why are we going to make it more complex? And I don't have an answer for that. Right. And so that's, that was, that was hard for me to learn. Um, we don't have time to figure out how to sequence this transformation. So there are some things that algorithms are just not invented yet to do really simple operations and do like one tenth of it, <laughs> right? Or pause it or remember where you left off. Like if you ever did the memento pattern for like gaming where you're trying to save where you left off, that can be hard to rebuild where you were at. Start on for loop, but instead of I equals zero, I equals 10, right? Like that's a weird mentality for algorithms. So sometimes it's just faster to just shove it in a Docker container and call it a day. Also, I inherited this. Sometimes people want to do serverless, but they inherited a stateful server-based architecture. And so how do they move to that? There's a ton of challenges, but also a ton of opportunities to make some things easier.
And when you think about some of the articles that say we have a monolith and we refactor pieces to microservices, think of that, but instead of refactor pieces to be serverless, and they're not all microservices. Sometimes they're like literal functions or you know, the ALB instead of the built-in load balancer they had inside the sidecar Docker container. Things like that can really, really help people. So it doesn't always have to be 100% serverless. You can compromise and say, look, we've got a path forward. Here's a set of options. Let's do the lowest hanging fruit right now and make your deployments painless, right? So stuff like that. I, compromising was a big deal because I, the more I learn in serverless, the more I immediately go, dude, we should do everything with this. And I'm like, well, that particular team doesn't want to, right? Or my team enjoys this particular language and they're fine with using Threadpool. They don't care about step function. They think it's more complicated and they're probably right. So a lot of that stuff is, as you learn serverless, you'll see a lot of guidance around, this is a team who built this product and they think that this is, fills a niche in AWS. And that's true, but that might not always be true for you. That might not always be true for those you're consulting with. And that's just, that's just part of learning. So compromise. It's, it's hard, but listen to what they have to say. So that's it. That's my advice, my challenges, all the things I learned about serverless for the past few years condensed in this video. Hope that was helpful. You got any other questions? Let me in the comments. I'm also Jester XL on Twitter. I'm more than happy to help you out. Hope this was helpful and keep learning, man. Serverless keeps growing. There's still a lot to learn. There's still, We're still kind of in the new. So there's a lot of mature tools, but there's also some immature tools. So it's a still a fun time to be in if you're interested in some of the innovation. It's not all figured out. So really, really fun time. So I hope you learned something. Hope that helps you out. Thank you for your time.